Thanks a lot. These were really two fascinating presentations, and I don't know what to say really in the face of all this expertise. And I'm also afraid that my bias will slightly be towards the latter case. Just, I think you're luckless. You're lucky that I'm not an expert on Mexican migration, and I think Gottfried. <laughs> so I think I'm going to target some of my errors more towards you than towards Doc Messi, but. I mean, I think these are two great presentations because they talk, I think, really about issues that are on the frontier of, of where we're talking about. And particularly, I think it came up during several times in this conference, the sort of, yes, we look at internal dynamics, so what we call networks and community causation, so how migration sort of leads to more migration or perhaps to less in the end. We talk about feedback, but how does that interact with things happening in the real big world out of us, and that can be policy restrictions, it can be big economic and political shifts, it can be political conflicts. How does that impact on those internal dynamics? So even if we are, uh, we like studying internal dynamics, it's crucial that we know how does that interact with broader processes of change, and I think both presentations talk through that. So um, if I may sort of summarize what, what will be my conclusion is that I, I, some crucial research questions I think for future particularly also comparative research. I think the Moroccan, and I'll come back to that later, and, and Mexican cases are great cases, actually, um, to compare. And I think there's more countries you can compare, particularly when we talk about these interactions. So how does macro-level change or external shocks affect migration system dynamics? So we talk about process of change is not directly affected by migration. Really, things that happen in, in the sort of macro-level, perhaps very indirectly they're affected by migration but um, we can sort of uh, consider them as external. And, and how do sort of ensuing changes in feedback me mechanisms, so within migration systems, then affect within migrant sending societies and communities patterns of social inclusion and exclusion? So I think because that's often the issue, because what we've seen both, uh, particularly in the Mexican case, I think, is that you know, restrictions haven't so much led to less migration, they have changed the way people migrate, and inevitably that's going to have an impact on the extent to which relatively poor, for instance, peasants in, in Mexico are going to have access to migration. You, it's not rocket science to say probably it's become more difficult for people who are sort of below the socioeconomic ladder to get access to migration. That's just one example of how the sort of macro level change does not so much perhaps lead to less migration per se, but of obviously changes uh, selection. So social inclusion and exclusion I think is crucial to this agenda. And, and how does it then affect people's capabilities and aspirations to migrate? And we're not just talking about migration, we're also talking about people who would like to migrate but can't migrate. And I think here, sort of Jürgen Carling's concept of involuntary immobility is also a very interesting. We talk about people who would like to migrate but can't migrate, which is a particularly pertinent phenomenon in migration-obsessed communities in countries like Morocco and Mexico. But in the end, I think the big question looming behind these three questions is how does migration shape and is shaped by inequality? And I think the sort of insights <laughs> emerging from different research projects is crucial to that much broader question. And even if we talk about different debates, for instance, migration and development, obviously this is very relevant, these sort of insights. How have migration policies by European, North American countries shaped people's access to migration in relatively poor countries? It's a crucial question. So even if we focus on those network dynamics and we sometimes ask, so what? It is actually very important that we understand how policies being um, thought up in wealthy countries are affecting people's access to migration, rather than this focus on volumes all the time. So I think migration inequality needs to be put back much stronger on the agenda, both in terms of what generates migration and what the impacts of migration are. Now, the comparison Mexico-Morocco is great. I mean, at IMI, we were lucky to have a small project called Transatlantic Dialogues on Migration and Development. And the Transatlantic Dialogue was a located a bit further south than people normally imagine it. We basically had a bunch of Moroccan researchers going to Mexico, and a year later Mexicans um, went to Morocco, and we had some field trips, and we had a seminar, and both uh, Moroccans and Mexicans were astonished, although they were skeptical in the beginning, like uh, the, everything is different, you know, religion, history, geography, whatever you think, it's all different. But when looking at the mechanisms of migration, both in terms of what drives the migration and in terms of the impacts, everybody was astonished about the parallels, if you think about the social mechanisms. The specificities were, were different, but many, many elements were there in common. Both Morocco and Mexico 
are the prime sources of migrant labor for the northern neighbors. Morocco has taken over Turkey in the mid-1990s as the main provider of migrant labor to Europe um, from non-European countries. Um, Morocco hasn't been substituted by Eastern European countries. Morocco migration has actually continued. Uh, both migrations are driven very strongly by labor demand in, 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 in neighboring countries to the north. Uh, both countries have more than 10% 10 10 of the population living abroad. Um, if we look at restrictions, I think the political setting in the US is really quite different. But on the other hand, also Europe has massively increased its investment in Frontex, the so-called fight against illegal migration. What have we seen in Morocco? Diversification of migration itineraries. Uh, people didn't cross the Strait of Gibraltar, what was the easiest crossing point for people who wanted to move in illegally. They started to, to cross in other points, and border controls were stiffened up, and people even diversified further. So the sort of area that Europe now has to control has massively increased, and it's almost impossible to control. People have to continue to migrate. Costs of migration have gone up. Risks of migration have gone up. Numbers of deaths have gone up, but people still migrate, as long as labor demand is there. But if you look at internal dynamics, I think both from, from your examples and, and the whole literature using the MMP and, and also emerging insights from the Themis project, and particularly when we look at the historical evolution of Moroccan migration, increasing reliance on family migration. I mean, besides uh, increasing regular migration, in a way, an increasing reliance on social capital. It, in a way, has strengthened network dynamics because in the past, where migration was less costly, people were relatively less dependent on family networks. So the dependent, so actually the paradox is that the restrictions may have strengthened the in internal dynamics of migration processes, may have strengthened those ties, may, and this is sort of counterweight against the restrictions. Um, and another, I think, parallel between Morocco and Mexico is a spatial diversification, both in terms of destinations. Here, Moroccans have increasingly moved to new destinations where it used to be France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Spain, Italy, and other countries have been added. But also, if you look at origin areas, I mean, the Mexican literature also shows that it's now pretty much from everywhere in Mexico that people migrate to the US, and exactly the same happened in Morocco, where in the past it was mainly in the north and some regions in the south, and now migration has spread all across the country. So the migration experience has become truly national. Um, so I think there is a real, um, talking about social mechanisms and feedbacks, yes, the specificities are very different, the history is different, but there is a lot of value in making such comparisons. And that project we had was not a proper research project, it was more exploratory, but it convinced us that such systemic comparisons are great, and I still hope that at some point we will have an MMP in Morocco <laughs> where we can do similar things, because unfortunately we don't have the same quality survey data, so we can be less sort of... Um, uh, s certain about certain things in the case of Morocco. But I think there's plenty of opportunities, particularly to see how have policy shaped those interactions and how have they shaped access. Now let me briefly come back to the, the presentations. I, I had a question to Douglas Messi, particularly, I mean, the picture you're sketching is extremely clear and I think inc inc extremely compelling and, and based on very solid macro and micro evidence. But how do you think is it currently, what's currently happening, affecting those internal dynamics? Because the pattern you're describing is that people have increasingly relied on family migration uh, as a sort of way to come in into the United States, that people are sort of have been pushed into permanent settlement, um, that the main driver of growth of Latino population is birth, so people already in the West. Does that imply, you think, that in the long, although the sort of restrictions have somehow reinforced, at least for the medium term, those sort of internal dynamics, do you think there will be an effect on the longer term of these cumulative causation mechanisms running out of steam, if, if there is less sort of new migration happening to the US? Or do you think this is more a temporary phenomenon than if, if labor <coughs> demand further picks up in the US that also that system picks up? Because in the press, I'm reading very contradictory story. I mean, sometimes you read the sort of new narrative about Mexico becoming a new destination and sort of the US becoming something not really attractive, a bit akin to what Hong Godfrey just said about Morocco, or is this just a temporary phase and are these sort of networks so strong that they can be easily sort of revitalized? So I was just wondering if there's any sort of new evidence on, on these internal dynamics. Um, m moving to Morocco, um, I think I'm Dutch. Um, I, I recognize a lot what you're saying about the hostile climate and definitely 
uh, Moroccan-Dutch migration seems to be an ending affair. Even if right-wing politicians still talk about floods of Moroccans coming, I mean, net migration is often around 1,000 a year. It's really near to nothing, but I mean, the narrative is very strong. And particularly because it's a Muslim immigration, it seems a failed Muslim immigration in particular, uh, the, the negative uh, climate is there. But I'm just wondering, reading your paper and listening to your presentation, are we really talking about diminutive causation or are we talking about simply f information flows going back? I mean, this has been described by, by, by uh, Everett Lee already in his 1966 article where he said, okay, there's pluses and minuses at origins and the information flows back through the network and this is how people make decisions whether they go or not. So, I mean, the Netherlands is currently not sort of in a happy state. I mean, we, the economy is shrinking. There, yes, there's a hostile climate as well. But there may be more interesting labor opportunities elsewhere, like in the informal sector in Spain, for instance, despite the crisis. Um, people still work there. So is it not just a matter, I just wanted to challenge you a little bit, is it not just a matter of information flowing back that right now it's not a good idea to come to the Netherlands? And if people want to come to the Netherlands, they'd rather postpone the trip rather than go right now or move to another country because there's simply better opportunities. So I'm just wondering, is it, is it more than that or, or is there something else going on? Because I was particularly thinking about this sort of idea that, I mean, restrictions are not new to Moroccan migration. That basic, that story already started in the 1970s after the oil crisis. So that's not a particularly new phenomenon. And despite that, migration has continued to the Netherlands for a very long period, has actually spiked after that period in the 1980s and 1990s, exactly because lots of so-called guest workers who were confronted with increasing border restrictions decided to stay on the safe side of the border and then became permanent settlers, which they never intended to be, neither the governments nor the migrants themselves, and that coincided with family migration. So the biggest peak in Moroccan migration in the Netherlands was after restrictions were introduced after visas were introduced, then we saw the biggest peak of Moroccan migration to the Netherlands. So is it a question of, of people not willing to help anymore, or is it a question of people simply understanding there's no good opportunities right now in the Netherlands? And I'm also not entirely convinced by your argument. You say, yeah, 30%, only 30% of Moroccans say we want to help people. I think the fact that you have been helped doesn't necessarily mean that you are able or willing to help somebody else. And perhaps people don't want to help people right now because there's no jobs, there's no opportunities. So perhaps that may change in the future. Uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure about that. Um, the same for the ambiguity there is in a way. Again, restrictions in a way have reinforced um, feedback mechanisms after 1973. Uh, they have, but they, ha they have perhaps changed the role of social capital in those processes. Because there's many ways social capital can be used in terms of information, and it's often been argued by Collier and others that sort of the weaker ties are often very, very important in terms of getting information on new potential destinations. And the stronger ties are important if you want to go there where your family is already. And perhaps the restrictions have sort of reinforced those sort of strong ties. But, um, um, they have actually continued migration over a time span of th three decades. So why do we see it tailing off now? Is this a result, again, of declining opportunities or something else? I mean, just to show a graph, this is, um, this is drawing on the new database from the Determinants of International Migration Project. We have been able to reconstruct Moroccan outflows by compiling inflow statistics from a whole range of predominantly European countries, plus Canada and the US. And, you know, restrictions were introduced in most European countries in this period. And what we've seen is a massive spiking of Moroccan migration to Europe, particularly in the era where the narrative sort of really rose about fighting illegal migration. We've seen actually a big boom of Moroccan migration to Europe. And what this is absolute numbers, this is rates from Morocco. So it, it tilts the graph a little bit, but even here you see actually a strong increase. And obviously we see a decrease, as you can see, which can be linked di directly to the global economic crisis. So I'm not so entirely convinced that you know, restrictions that have been, since the oil crisis, have become increasingly strong. Sort of at face value, we don't see a sort of big effect. So is this really a convincing explanation? And if we see the composition of Moroccan migration to the OECD, yes, the Netherlands, which was a major destination, let's say in the late 1970s, 70s, it's the green part of the graph, have really shrunk to almost near to nothing. But other destinations have come up, particularly 
Spain and Italy have become prime destinations of Moroccan migrants. So is it not simply a case of diversion of flows uh, to other destinations? Or are we really talking about diminutive flotation? Um, and, and another graph, I mean, this is also compiling immigration statistics from some northwestern European destinations. And the, 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 the black dotted line is, is GDP growth. And we see a very strong correlation between GDP growth and inflows of Morocco. So again, it leads me to the question, is the, sh the declining migration from Moroccans to a country like the Netherlands not simply the fact of <laughs> decreasing opportunities and that information flowing back to Morocco? Or are we really talking about a change in the internal dynamics? Um, and the last point on that, I was thinking about integration. Is it also not partly a wish to belong to Moroccan society? And could that not be part of the uh, undermining internal dynamics? That there is a dynamic where settled Moroccans, and this is more based on my own sort of day-to-day yeah, -day talks with Moroccans in the Netherlands, that there are quite some second, third generation that don't necessarily see more migration as desirable because they think new, they can harm the image of their own group and that can be a sort of dynamic that cannot make it understandable why, and it's quite well described for many migrant groups, that they don't necessarily like more people coming in, particularly if they're from lower class backgrounds. And is that not perhaps another reason why people uh, are less willing uh, to help? So to conclude, I think we still talk a lot about networks. I think there are a lot of other sort of feedback mechanisms that have been described in the literature. I mean, we talked a little bit about um, and, and inequality, and I think particularly that, that issue is really crucial, because if it is true that restrictions both in Europe for Moroccans and other Maghrebians coming, and in um, the United States for Mexicans coming in, haven't so much stopped migration, but changed the phase of migration, in particular has it made more difficult for poor people to migrate. This may actually reinforce inequalities in migrant sending communities where, in migrant sending societies where those who have access to migration become the sort of haves in communities and those who haven't become increasingly impoverished, which then may lead to high migration aspirations with a lack of opportunities to migrate and a high level of experience deprivation. And I think these questions are really key for sort of future migration research because we sort of have does this work? I mean, we, we are focusing on these sort of receiving, sort of meso level context, these interactions, but how does the macro context affect those dynamics? I still think this is a great area for future research. And also, if I think about how policy has affected this, policy leads to people moving through other categories, like moving from labor to, to, to family migration, to, to undocumented migration. They may change the timing of migration, so the sort of now or never migrations, if new restrictions are introduced, like the beat to ban rushes, which we saw with the West Indies here in, in the UK. Spatial diversion, I think, has been described in all of these cases, but also decreasing return and circulation, which is the exact opposite of what policies officially aim to do, although perhaps politicians are not actually interested in the result. That's another issue. But again, I think, what are the implications of these policy restrictions for patterns of inclusion and exclusion and migra migration processes? So that brings me back to my first slide. I mean, this is, to me, the real agenda uh, that is really important to look at the interactions between those internal dynamic studies. And I think the the papers presented at this project and the different projects and the data coming up is massively increasing our um, capacity to get a better understanding, particularly also in non-Mexican US settings. And I think that, that that's really great about the new data that we can do much more comparative research. Uh, but how does it affect patterns of migration and uh, inequality? Thank, thank you a lot. Thank you.